This is just a warning to let you guys know. This video does discuss the cycle of addiction and references both drug addiction and alcoholism. While I did avoid using any kind of triggering content, there is one part where I discuss some of the thoughts that may go into your head that may make you more inclined to want to relapse. Otherwise, this video just talks about the cycle of addiction and how addicts commonly go from sober to using. May it be their very first time using or if it is a relapse. The only other warning I want to give is that I am just a freshly sober person myself. I am just a little over five months sober when I made this. I am not an expert. I don't have a degree or anything like that. I'm just someone experiencing sobriety for the first time and wanting to use my platform to share the things I learn because a lot of people do not have access to the tools that I've been fortunate enough to have and due to that I want to make sure I can use my platform for good and help the people who do want to learn more about sobriety but may not have the ability to access some of the tools that I have been able to have. With that being said, I will reiterate that a lot of the stuff in the recovery community is free and there is so many options out there available for you if you do need help. There is absolutely help out there for you. Hey, hello and welcome back to my second channel. This video is a little bit different kind of style than what I've been doing so far. As you notice, there's a whiteboard behind me. I'm actually re-filming this. I filmed it a while back, a few weeks ago, and I filmed it when a film crew was actually at my house working on a bit for their magazine, or not even for their magazine, I just made that up. They don't have a magazine. They have a YouTube channel, a TV program, and a few other, a website. So they came here, they flew down here from the, uh, New York, and they brought a film crew, and they did it all, and they were here for like seven hours, and there's a cricket in the background, of course. I'm sorry, that's gonna drive everyone nuts, but I can't make the cricket shut up, so cool. It literally wasn't making any noise until I pressed film, and then it heard my voice and it just got pissed off. Cool. Anyway, they had their own lighting they brought with them to film from their angle, and because of that, from my angle, I couldn't put my lights up, and the lighting looked absolutely horrible. So I'm refilming the whole thing because the lighting just didn't work, which kind of sucks because, like, I looked cute in that. I mean, I'll move that so I don't see, like, the camera. Yeah, like, this way a little? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it work angled this way better? Yeah, yours is great. Or should I have it straight up? Let's see. She's wide. Are you wide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can have it like this. What part of the uh, board are you going to be writing on? I don't even know where it is, but basically I'm going to write the word here. It's going to be a circle. And then I'm going to go from here to here. I think we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here. We're looking okay. good. Okay, cool. Um, is there a eraser? No. Oh, oh is it? I don't think that's an eraser, but it's working. <laughs> and that's the cycle of addiction. Thank you for watching. Like. That was a cute look. But anyway, today's video, we are going to be talking about the cycle of burping. That was a weird hiccup. Anyway, we're gonna be talking about the cycle of addiction and how it works in the brain. I do wanna talk more about how, not only my personal experience with addiction, but just how addiction works. And I tried to like decide in my head where I wanted to start because eventually I do wanna get more into the like scientific side of it and everything. But if I start there, it'll be really overwhelming for people because it would have been way too overwhelming for me to hear all that, like day one in rehab. So I'm gonna start with the simple stuff that like, would have helped me at the very beginning start to understand how addiction works. I have a lot of really fun stuff planned on this channel. This channel is my personal channel, so it's just gonna have like personal vlogs, my daily stuff, things that don't have to do with animals exactly, but it's also my channel that I wanna talk about addiction a lot on and go through all of that. So I actually am in talks with a doctor that I really, really, really respect. He's a really cool doctor that he came and did some doctor lectures at my rehab and he taught me so much about addiction. And he's one of, from what my rehab has said, and from what my therapists have told me now in IOP. He's a really, really respected, highly reputable doctor in America. So hopefully he's gonna be coming on my channel. His name is Dr. Boone and I'm in, I'm, I'm speaking with him right now via email about setting that up and he seems to be into it from what we've spoken about. So it looks like that's gonna happen and that's really fun. When I officially get the word that that's gonna happen, I'm going to post something online where you guys can send in some questions and things that you may not understand very well about addiction. And I'm gonna interview him with my own questions and with those questions too. So hopefully that'll help a lot of people understand some things that maybe I'm not doing too well at making very clear. So with that being said, I'm gonna go now into the actual video and about how the cycle of addiction works. This is not gonna be very sciencey or anything like that. This is going to be very easy for people to understand. It was very easy for me to understand. Basically, I always knew that addicts didn't 
have full and complete control over what they did but I didn't really understand why or how that worked and in a way I didn't fully believe it I kind of did think you know I could put this down if I wanted to and I'm just being stupid and dumb and I don't understand why I thought maybe I was just being um I don't know what the right word is stubborn and not wanting to quit just because I was weak I started to think maybe everyone else was stronger than me and could put down this drug and I couldn't I didn't fully understand what was going on in my body that made it so hard to stop so there's a cycle of events that happen from before you pick up the drug to losing the choice to losing control to getting sober and I'm gonna go over that little circle of events and how it works in a very easy to understand way and of course again this is not using any medical terms or anything like that this is just a very easy to understand flow chart basically before we even start the flow chart I'm gonna start with drawing a little person and we'll get into that in a second <laughs> so basically pretend this is you Okay, um, I'm gonna make that person, eh, I could use that as the body. There's the head. I'm wearing a beanie, so here's my hair. Uh, and this is my beanie. Oops. And there's my weird little piercing from my beanie that hangs down, and there's me. So that's me with my weird little beanie. And, um, okay, so there's, that's my beautiful picture of me with the piercing coming down from my beanie, and I don't really have a nose but that's fine. And I have really way too big of lips, so there we go. That's me. And that's my body, perfect representation. My arms, and my legs, and this is my heart. <laughs> Everyone who is an addict has this weird little hole in them, we'll say, this little circle, okay? Every single person that's an addict has this little hole inside of us, basically. And this is where all of our emotions, like all of our, anything we deal with, stress goes into there, our emotions, any traumatic events, just everything that we hold inside of us that we don't talk about or deal with goes into that hole. And when it goes into that hole, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more filled with crap, basically. And when this is happening, it's telling our brain that we need to make this stop in any way possible. So the illness of addiction is basically telling us we have this thing inside of us that is not right and instead of like going and getting treatment for it and stuff because we might not even fully recognize that we're carrying all this weight with us we might not be good at you know talking about it we might be denying our own oh I just dropped the back of this we might be denying our own trauma we might be you know whatever the reason is that we're suppressing this stuff we have suppressed it whatever reason it is and by suppressing all this crap it goes and tells our brain that we need to do something, anything we can to numb it. And as an addict, if you have even tried drinking before casually at a restaurant or something, you don't have a problem necessarily, but you've picked up some kind of substance. Your brain says, hey, remember that one time? It's really hard to draw from this angle, but it says like, hey, remember that one time you got a drink? That's a drink. I don't know why you're drinking alcohol from a straw, but whatever. And it says, hey, remember that one time you got a drink? It kind of relaxed you and it made you kind of forget about this stuff. Maybe go get another one. And so you remember that and you think, okay, I'll have one drink. And so you go, you get your one drink because your brain tells you, hey, that's gonna make you feel so much better. And you get that one drink and then suddenly over the course of time, it goes from one drink to 20 to 100 and you can't stop and then you're on drugs or maybe you just end up an alcoholic. Either way, it's just as serious. Basically, the way we get this notion to pick this up is from this yucky stuff inside of us. I just call that the yuck, the yuck inside of me. And now we're gonna talk about the whole process, but that's just basically when I'm talking about, if I'm referencing the yuck, that's the thing I'm referencing, okay? This is such a scientific video. <laughs> okay, so that's the yuck. We're gonna talk about the whole circle. It's really hard to draw from this angle, so I'm sorry that it's so sloppy. I'm just struggling really hard here. <laughs> Another thing I will add really quick, I don't know if you guys know, but the symbol for like Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff is a triangle. And there's a few different reasons it's a triangle, but one of the reasons is because the illness of addiction or alcoholism is an illness of not only the mind, that's an M, but also the body and the spirit. So that's three different little things, right? And there is a very good reason that it's a three-pronged illness. And when you hear spirit, don't think of religion. That's not what this means. A lot of people get thrown off by the spirit part and think that that means like it's a illness that you need to find God in order to get better. That's not really what it means. So we'll go into that too. God can be the answer for some people, but 
that's definitely not what it means. Basically, it starts with a spiritual issue. And that's what I said, I'll get into what that means. But it starts with a spiritual issue. And during this time, that is when we have this problem inside of us that is just not right. We have this hole inside of us, this emptiness, we have this suppressed trauma, we have these issues. It might just be even normal day-to-day -day stress, just whatever that makes us, sets us off as a person. And I will get into more of like the five main reasons that cause this stuff in a little bit, but basically the spirit is what starts everything. And that's some kind of spiritual issue inside where you are dealing with your soul. So you could replace the word spirit with soul also, whatever you want to call it. It's just the stuff inside that you carry with you every day. There's something about that that, you know, is setting you off, making you uncomfortable, making you discontent with your life. And because of that, that starts this whole cycle. So here is the cycle. So that's, there's this big old cycle and it starts here. Okay, so whatever this is, let me just move you guys closer. Okay, so whatever you guys want to call it, if you want to call it your spirit or if you want to call it your soul, either way, it's sick. If you have some kind of spiritual sickness, or a sickness in your soul, which is just all of this crap that you deal with, basically. And this goes over here to your mind. Oh, it is zoomed out. All right. <laughs> so that goes over to your mind and that's where the obsession starts. And it starts to obsess that if you just had this drink or that pill, whatever, it's supposed to be a pill, you know, that like two colored pill thing. I don't, hey, remember when you went to that party and you tried cocaine? That's supposed to be a Ziploc baggie and that's supposed to be a pill and that's supposed to be a drink. <laughs> But basically your brain tells you, hey, remember when you had this, or remember when you had this, or remember when you had this? That made all of this stop. It made all of this go away and it made your brain feel okay again and everything felt peaceful. And your brain starts to obsess over it and tell you that if you just had that, again, whatever it is, that you will be okay again and that you won't feel so horrible. This part can get very, very real. I mean, the mental side of it can be very real, very, very scary, very overpowering, and you start to get really, really scared that you have no other choice. Basically, it feels like no matter what you do, you're not gonna stop obsessing about it. You could try so hard to distract yourself and all your brain is doing is saying, you need it, you need it, you need it, you need it. It's like, if you haven't had water, and I always use this comparison, but like, if you haven't drank water in, you know, so many days, you haven't had anything to drink, and you're friend is sitting across the room with a glass of water chugging it and you're just trying to do anything you can to ignore the fact that you really need that drink or say like you really need to pee and you hear a water sound and you're trying so hard to distract yourself from how bad you need to pee but you really need to pee it's that kind of like trying to ignore something that feels so so very real and it's very similar in that sense to kind of like how obsessive compulsive disorder works where you try really hard to distract yourself but for some reason your brain tells you you have to touch something so many times or you have to wash your hands so many times or you have to do something so many times. It is a very, very real illness and the obsession is insanely real and insanely hard to battle sometimes. But at this point, you technically do still have control. So basically there's a line and this is the side where you can get help. You can get help on this side and this is where there's no control. All of us are at different places over here before we pick up drink or first drink or drug. So we may be way over here when we start to feel crappy and then we start to get this obsessive thought and it brings us a little closer to over here. If we just get to right here and we go get help, we're fine, we still have control, it's fine. But if we start here and then we ignore the obsession and we ignore the obsession and we ignore the obsession, all of a sudden it gets to the point where we don't have control and you cannot ignore it. It'd be like trying to tell someone again with like OCD, like you can't do any of those things that you were obsessing about. And there's even people that, let's say their problem is alcohol, when they get to this point, they get in the car and they start driving and they don't even remember and then they come to and they're at the liquor store. And I mean, it can get very, very real once you cross this line mentally. Like I said, we're all at a different place over here. And the more help you get, the further away you get from crossing the line. But I mean, if you are right here and then the obsessive thought starts, you're immediately over to no control and you're just starting the cycle immediately. So that's why it's so important to not just put down the drink or drug, but actually get help. Because if you don't get help, you'll always be teetering back and forth right here. And anything can set you off and put you back over to losing control. So with that in mind, right here when this part starts is where you can get help if you notice the symptoms. Not everyone notices it. Some people, you know, don't pay attention. Some people try to deny it. Some people don't know that they need help, whatever it may be. 
they don't know that they're this close to crossing the line so they try to ignore it and then it's too late so even if you know someone relapses that doesn't mean you need to go up to them and tell them hey you could have gotten help what's wrong with you you don't know their life you don't know what led them there and you don't know exactly if they were able to really sit and say hmm I should be able to get help right now and I know exactly how to get it and I know where and I know it'll help and I know I'll feel better you don't know where they are mentally here and sometimes all those thoughts don't even happen and they don't notice that they're getting back into this and they think that they can still control it and then they don't they suddenly can't. So just because they do technically, yes, they do have an ability to get help. I do not think that shaming an addict helps whatsoever. I don't think telling them, hey, you could have just gotten help helps. If they pick back up and you tell them that, that just makes them feel more ashamed. That's not going to help them. So no matter what you think of it, shame doesn't help. So in between this part and the next part is where you lose your control because you go over the line. So if you keep going in this cycle after the obsession this is where the no choice comes in where you all of a sudden feel like you have to do it so all of a sudden this is where they feel like they absolutely have to do it and that they need it or they will not be able to like breathe and at the same time as this feeling is happening that is when the body part comes in and the body part of the illness is the craving and it's also known as the allergy. So this is where the body part of the illness comes in. So right here we have the, the spirit, the mind, and then the body. And this is where the physical craving starts. So right here, during this time right here, is where all of the mental part of the illness goes into an actual physical reaction, where it's not just a mental obsession, but you actually have a physical craving. And this is where you pick up once. This is where all the lies happen, where your brain is telling you, if you just have that drink one time, it won't be like that last time where it got really out of hand, because now you know that you have a problem, so now this time you know after one drink you have to stop, or something like that. You convince yourself, however it may be, this is what someone does when they're sick. They convince themselves that they have control. Personally, for example, I had a problem with IV heroin where I could not stop every single day. While yes, before that, drugs were still a big part of my life that were not helping my life in any way, I was always able to eventually stop in the past. I'm not still popping pills, I'm not still snorting cocaine, so obviously I was able to stop. Now with IV heroin, I had to go to rehab to stop. So in my brain, I might tell myself, I might be able to use cocaine or I might be able to take prescription opiates, but just not IV heroin. And for example, I was dating someone who told me that they technically had not relapsed when they were smoking heroin because their problem was actual IV heroin. And so the addict might convince themselves that, you know, it's okay if I just smoke heroin because I'm not shooting it or whatever it is. It's obviously an illness, it's obviously delusional, and if you heard of anyone that is trying to pick something back up that destroyed their entire life, you would say, oh my god, that's crazy. I mean, say instead of drugs or alcohol, it was, there's an actual very popular story in the Alcoholics Anonymous book, and I will read it eventually, but it's called The Jaywalker Story, and it's about a guy that was obsessed with jaywalking. And every single time he jaywalked, he would get hit by a car. It started with just like minor fractures, but it got all the way up to severe bone breaks. And the doctor finally told him, if you keep jaywalking, you're going to kill yourself and you will die. And everyone's like, obviously there's no point in jaywalking. Why not just go cross the street safely? But he still does it and he throws himself in front of a car again and obviously that's delusional anyone outside of that situation would look at it and say that person is crazy but that is what addiction is it is an illness that tells somebody that they have to do something that they are perfectly aware of how much it ruins their life they are perfectly aware of the fact they don't have control but with that they still do it and that is because of this whole illness in their body. If you just exchange, you know, drugs or alcohol for, you know, like I said, throwing yourself in front of a car, it sounds a lot crazier that way. But it really is the same thing and that's why it's printed in the Alcoholics Anonymous book and I'll read that story later. But like I said, it's this delusion that doing something that absolutely destroys your life will somehow help your brain feel better. And that is because your brain is telling you you need it and that is because there's even a physical extent to it where your body tells you you need it and it's this whole thing. So I'll get into that more later, but right now we're just gonna continue this. So right now we are at the time where you pick up once after you start having this 
craving. So you pick up once that your one drink, your one pill, your one line or whatever, and it sets off this allergy. And it's this reaction where your body does not respond to it the way that other people's bodies would respond to these things. When I say that, there are a few people that got this very misconstrued online when I said this. I will have, like I said, the doctor come online and talk about this, but in rehab we were taught that about 15% of the population struggles with addiction and that the other 85% of people have normal brains. I talked about this online and for some reason people thought that I meant that only 15% of people can't use drugs and that everyone else can use heroin fine. I don't know why that idea got, got around online, but I've seen it in multiple comments where people are like, you can't trust Taylor when she's talking about addiction because she says that 85% of people can use heroin fine. I never said that. It's the idea of that there's only 15% of people with this allergy, allergic reaction kind of thing to drugs and this whole process that continues in their life over and over and over unless they continuously get help. Only a certain amount of people, whether it's 15% and my doctor is right, or my doctor was wrong and it's 2%, whether it's 99%, whatever it is, there is a group of people in this world that have this mental illness. And then there is a group of people who don't. Just wanna interject real quick and say, I found it so weird. I was Googling that quote to try to find that comment that I saw once. And I found this group of people that are so angry that I said a percentage of people had addiction because apparently that meant that I was trying to say I was part of a special group and that I was more special than everyone else. <laughs> what? I was just stating a statistic. There's a percentage of people with every illness. If I said the percentage of people that had depression, I definitely wouldn't be trying to say I'm part of a fun little group that has depression. I would just be stating the fact. I'm not declaring I'm part of a special group. My little brother has something called Prader-Willi syndrome. They say that only every like 15,000 births are people with Prader-Willi syndrome. And I'm sure they're not bragging about that. I literally was just stating the percentage. I'd love to not be a part of it. I don't get how people get upset over something like that. Even if it's wrong, the percentage amount, that would be like, hey, you got the percentage wrong. Not that I'm trying to be part of a group. I am just, y'all confused the hell out of me. Also, when I was looking for that one little comment that I wanted to show, I had to open the site that I purposely try to avoid going to at all costs. I haven't been to it since well before leaving rehab. I know that for sure. But I went to it today to just show the crazy misconstrued way they've twisted my words. In less than half an hour, all of this was said about me. This website is literally updated by the minute about me for the last at least two years, if not more. And in just less than half an hour, this many things was said about me. I just, they insist that they're, this is criticism and that they're just concerned. This is crazy. Anyway, I'm just gonna get back to the video, but this is absurd. Don't ever listen to people who call you this kind of stuff. It's just complete, complete crap. It's insane. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, 100% of people who pick up heroin is doing something dangerous. The best way I can compare it is to actually depression. You know that there are people with clinical depression. They're diagnosed with it, they're born with it. Even when life is technically going good around them mentally, they are struggling. That is, you know, a quick idea of the mental illness of depression. Now, not everyone has that, but everyone can get depressed. Everyone can go through something in their life traumatic or hard enough to make them go into a depression, but not everyone has the mental illness of depression. Just like everyone can have anxiety and experience anxiety, but not every single person has clinically diagnosed chronic anxiety. So anyone that picks up heroin over and over and over again is going to get addicted. Anyone that picks up opiates again and again and again is going to get addicted. Anyone that keeps drinking is gonna have a problem. Anyone that snorts cocaine every day is gonna have a problem. But not every single person is born with this mental problem with drugs, this mental obsession with alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be for this person. Not everyone is born with that. Not everyone is born with addiction. Addiction is not just the um, habit of doing something over and over again, like addictive personality. It's an actual illness. So yes, anyone can get into a place in their life where they are feeling low and they think maybe if I use drugs, I'll feel better. Anyone can get in that place and that is still just as serious. They still need to go to rehab and get off the drugs and then have a healthy life after that. When someone does not have the mental 
mental illness that this entails, when they get off this drug that they are dependent on, they will feel okay and they will feel fine and they will feel better. For example, if someone gets prescribed pain meds and they take them so many times that, that it hurts to be without them because they are addicted. If you wean them off safely and you get them off the drug, they will be okay and they will not experience life sober the way that an addict experiences life sober. Someone who isn't an addict may not have to get this much help after they get off of their drug. They might have used a drug for a year because, you know, they like go to parties and the party scene and stuff. They realize it's not good for them and so they can put it down. An addict, if they realize that this thing is destroying them, they won't put it down. They won't want help. They won't want to get help. They will deny it to their grave because their brain is telling them they need it. So normally, anyone who sees that something is becoming a problem in their life would want to get help and get it to stop, but addicts can't do it. There is this disconnect in their brain that tells them that there is that it is okay. It'll do anything to convince them that they will be okay and they don't need to get off this drug. That is why so many addicts end up homeless. I don't think people realize that after you take drugs for a specific amount of time, they don't give you that desirable effect anymore. All it'll do is stop you from feeling sick. It'll make you feel like you were sober, basically. That's how I felt on heroin for like the last five months I was on heroin. I didn't feel high. I didn't feel great. I just felt like I was able to function. And and there is not that makes no sense like why would you be willing to lose your house and your job and your family and your friends to just be able to function how you could without this drug and that is because your brain tells you you will not be okay without it and that you absolutely need it so there is a lot that goes into that I'll keep going into it more and more videos but I just wanted to uh, make it clear that no I never said that only 15% of people can't use heroin I don't advertise anyone use heroin if you are not an addict if you are an addict I don't care don't pick up heroin it is highly addictive for everyone it is very hard to get off of that is just how your brain responds to it doesn't matter if you actually have this mental illness or not it can get confusing for sure the best way I can explain it is the whole everyone can get depressed but not everyone has depression thing similar to that let's continue <laughs> I'm sorry for going on these rants I'm very passionate about this topic so we are right here again where we just picked up the first drug and it set off this allergy where our brain is now telling us uh, just one more or okay uh, just pick up you know maybe again tomorrow night or it kind of starts maybe slowly where you tell yourself okay only on weekends will I do this or only on Sundays at 4 p.m. will I pick up. But it starts this reaction where your brain starts to say you need it and you start planning out every single time you can have it, start you know, obsessing over exactly when to get it, it starts becoming a huge focus in your life. And that sets off this spree. So that sets off the spree. And the spree can be any period of time. It could start very, very slow, gradual. Like I said, you start on weekends only. You just start incorporating it back into your life. Having a drink, you know, every, you know, whatever, three or four months at a party is not a sign of an addict or an alcoholic, but a sign of an addict or an alcoholic is this whole process of obsessing over it, feeling like you need it, setting off this reaction where you feel so sick without it you start to obsess about it you start to think uh when can i get it when can i get it when can i get it and this all happens again from this thing inside of you so you're on this spree now where maybe it starts gradually maybe you go right into it for example the very first time i picked up iv heroin I did not stop. I just kept going and going and going and going and going and going and going until I got sober. And it was almost a year of a spree. So you do this for however long. It doesn't matter how long it is, but you do this. You're on your spree. You're having your thing. You're going downhill. Eventually, things start happening in your life even if it's something minor, you just start to realize that you are doing this again. You are starting to prioritize drugs over everything else. You might start to lose family members, you might start to lose friends, you might start to, you know, your job might start to suffer from it. And it can be very slow before you start to see all that happening, depending on where your mental state is. Because some addicts only like teeter right here on the line of no control and control instead of being like way over here immediately. But eventually you're gonna get further and further and further away from being able to get help. So 
you know, for a while you may be right here where you're still able to go to school, you're still able to go to work fine, you're still able to do all your errands and see your friends and go to parties, but eventually it's gonna get way over here where all of a sudden you can't always get to work or you need to go get your fix way more often than normal or something is gonna start happening in your life where this drug or your alcohol is starting to become way more prioritized over everything else. And eventually you are going to be like, what the hell have I done? You're going to feel very ashamed. You're going to feel disgusted. You're going to feel scared. You're going to feel worried. You're gonna feel like your life is ruined. And this is called emerging remorseful. After your spree, you emerge remorseful. You're still using right here. So at this point, you're still using, that's a little blurred, you can't see it, but you're still using or drinking at this point and basically you feel like Ooh. you're like what have I done I didn't want this to happen in my life I told myself it would only be one drink one drug one line of coke I just wanted this to stop and as you're doing all of this crap this hole inside of you is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger which feeds this which feeds this which feeds this which feeds this so your spree is only making this bigger which continues this part of the circle over and over and over and over and over and over and over until it's so bad that you're like what the hell have I done and when you get to this point you normally come up with some kind of promise to yourself. You start to say, I, what have I done? I will never do this again. You know, I need to stop. For me, very, very quickly into using IV opiates because I wasn't immediately on heroin. I was started with Dilaudid and then Roxycontin. But for me, when I started to get around the area I was on heroin, which is only like a month and a half in, I immediately was like, what have I done? I need to stop. And that's why in January I did get sober for four days. And that's gonna be a perfect example of this pattern. But even every single night when I was like, what have I done? I am done. And I would finish whatever's left of the baggie. I would, there was this one time I finished everything that we had left. We collected all of our dirty needles, all of the supplies that we used to help use. We got a big trash bag and we went we went together and again I know I really wish we would have safely thrown needles out but we just that wasn't a priority then but we collected all of it and we went to the trash chute and we opened it up and we threw the trash bag down the trash chute with all of our paraphernalia and I just held my boyfriend at the time and I cried and cried and cried because I was like it's finally over I'm finally done with this we're finally gonna get better and then I woke up the next morning and I felt like hell on earth and that's where this part comes. So when I threw out all the paraphernalia, I was doing this part of the cycle where I say never again. So I tell myself never again. And there is a lot of guilt. Let me move all this out of the way. There's a lot of guilt and shame. So I just completed the circle. <laughs> so hopefully you can see all that. If you can't see it all, I'm gonna talk through it. But when I was throwing out all the needles, I was here. I was hugging him, I was crying, I felt horrible, I felt guilty and ashamed. I was telling myself, never again, I am done, and we are gonna get better. And then I woke up, I felt like shit, and then I woke up and relapsed. And honestly, when I woke up and relapsed, it wasn't even because of this. It was honestly because of this and this. My mind and my body, I was having withdrawals, both mental and physical. So I went straight from here back to here, but, if you do get sober, so I did end up getting sober in January. I went, I got sober, I made it through withdrawals, I got on Suboxone, I was fine, I wasn't having any cravings, I was fine. There was no reason to pick a drug back up. It was ruining my life, it was ruining my boyfriend at the time's life. He was about to get kicked out of his band. My mom and my, my parents were worrying sick about me. I never left my house anymore. I never made videos anymore. It was ruining my life and I hated it. So I finally got off of it and I was so, so, so happy to get off of it. So why did I pick back up? Well, <laughs> so I got to Disney World and all I had done at this time was put down the drug. I put it down, which is huge. It's an, it's an amazing step and a huge accomplishment to do. But I put down the drug, but I did not do anything to fix all this. So again, when I started using, maybe my hole was like this, but by the time I finished, I had so much guilt and shame and crap and embarrassment and remorse and horrible, disgusting feelings that my hole was massive. <laughs>
please don't just take that sentence out and just use it somewhere just by itself because it just sounds horrible. My hole was massive. But this was massive and I was doing nothing to treat it. I was doing nothing to get help. I wasn't doing anything to get better. I was off of these drugs and I was in Disney World, my favorite place on the planet. At this time, I would not say that I was sober. I would say that I was dry. Dry time is basically in between picking up your next drug. It's like when you put down your drug and then before you pick it back up, but it's when you're not doing anything to get better, you don't really wanna be there, you're in this awkward place, you're not working on yourself, and especially if you know you end up picking back up two weeks later, that's a good sign that you weren't really sober, you were just dry. So I actually picked up four days later, I went to Disney World for about three days, and then I told my mom, I hadn't left a hotel once, I stayed in the hotel the whole time, and I told my mom, like, I'm sorry, I can't do this, I need to go home. And so then I flew home from Disney World, back home and I relapsed that night. There was no reason to shoot up again. There was not any reason to do that. But what it did do was make all this feel like it wasn't there and make me feel okay again. And it made my sickness feel okay again. So you get to this part where you feel guilt and shame and horrible and you tell yourself never again. And if you do manage to put it down, if you don't get help, you're just as sick as ever. You're just barely, you know, still right in the middle of this line that you crossed and then you just started all over again. I got sober, I felt sick still, I felt horrible on the inside, I had all of this wrong. All of this was telling me if I just pick that drug back up, I'd feel okay again. My mind won't stop obsessing. I tell myself I absolutely have to. I stay crossed on this line because I didn't know I could get help. I didn't understand that there was actual help for this. Um, my attempt to get help had failed. I had gotten sober, but I was still miserable. So I figured there's no, there's no answer for me. When I'm sober, I'm miserable. So there's obviously no help. So instead of getting help, I lose the choice again. I fly home, I use, I pick up once. I don't stop because I can't stop. It sets off the allergy. I go on a spree. I feel remorseful. I'm like, what have I done? It's been two more months now and I still haven't stopped. There's definitely something wrong with me. I say never again. I tell myself in the morning I'm gonna get sober. I feel horrible. I feel guilty. I wake up. I'm in withdrawals. I do it all over again. So the idea is that is the cycle of addiction in your brain. The idea is that if you do not get help, if you do not find real actual help, this cycle is bound to continue unless you just, you have to treat this. Because if you treat this, if you make this go away, if you treat this whole and now it's gone, that's the thing that triggers your illness. So you are so much less likely without this part that's telling you to get all this. So there's, your illness is not telling you you have to get all this because now you've gone to therapy, you've treated all this, you've worked hard on this for months, so now it's gone. And now anytime problems arise, you talk to the therapist about it and you get help, which stops it from coming back up. So if you treat all this, you are so much less likely to be spiritually sick. And if you are not sick, your mind won't obsess about it. And if your mind doesn't obsess about it, your body won't start the, the cravings. If you don't start the cravings, you don't go on the spree where you pick up. So the idea is to treat this illness, you have to treat this. And if you don't treat this, this will all happen. Now, if you do treat this, you still have to every day, you know, work on yourself and live your life cautiously. You have to figure out what you can and can't have in your life. You have to shape your life around how to treat this because even if there is none of this going on, if for some reason you decide, you know, now all this is gone so I can safely probably use heroin, no. The second you pick up heroin, if this isn't even going on, you just jumped right to here instead. So you still started the process over again, even if there is no yuck inside of you. You just skipped the process where you felt like you had to and you made the choice to, which you still deserve to get help if you did that. That's not a bad thing. That's not shameful. It's okay. We all have different lives. It's all, you know, we want to feel normal and that's okay. Um, a lot of addicts do experiment and try to decide, you know, what's safe in my life and what's not. That's okay. There are some addicts that can safely drink or like smoke weed. I can't smoke weed. Weed makes me want to get right back on heroin and starts the obsession the second I smoke weed. 
Um, I have tried to drink. I haven't had any bad reactions yet to just moderately drinking, but I might in the future. I don't know. I don't think it's even important enough to try to include in my life. I just was dumb and wanted to try it. But like also some alcoholics can get in, get injured and go get surgery and be given opiates and they're fine. While other alcoholics can get surgery, be given opiates and it triggers the body obsession and craving for them for alcohol. So everyone's different on this spectrum. It's obviously Obviously an illness that has more intense versions and less intense versions. Well, this part about illness being a spectrum is something I'm still recently exploring. A while back I posted that I couldn't safely smoke weed and that I didn't love that people portray it as 100% safe for everyone. Since getting sober I've had many many people push weed onto me. It happened a lot before I got sober also and I always reacted poorly to it. And as an addict, it also really triggers me to want opiates. Since posting that, I actually got a lot of criticism that some addicts actually can safely smoke and others even said they can safely drink. Since then, I decided to try a drink after telling my therapist that I planned to try it. I don't think it was a great decision, but it happened. I think it was just a weak moment as an addict and I wanted to feel normal again. I haven't experienced worse and cravings yet, but I wanted to be honest about this regardless, so I didn't try to hide my attempt at trying to drink. Regardless of all this, I do still believe addicts best chance at staying healthy is by avoiding all substances. Some can surely handle mouthwash and things like that while others can't, but when it comes to things like blatantly drinking, I think it is a very, very fine line between safe and disastrous. With that in mind, I still decided to do it. Although I do believe in the fact that complete sobriety from all substances is best, I sometimes fail to be the most flawless example of recovery and I want to be honest about all my ups and downs. For example, this whole video is about the cycle of addiction and how to notice when you're going to relapse. So if I ever happened to relapse, I'd still believe all of these things I'm telling you guys right now and how I could potentially have gotten help if I would have paid attention. But if I relapse, I relapse and I'm gonna have to be honest about that. So far everything's been good though and I really hope everything continues to be, but I just wanted to make it clear that some of the things I do believe in I won't always be perfect at doing myself because I'm learning along with everyone. I do think complete abstinence from all substances is best. I did decide to experiment pretty early and therefore I wanted to include it in here. I still don't know how I feel about my attempt to drink and I honestly have zero plans to ever try it again, but I'll have to wait a few months to be able to fully tell you about all of this. The reason for that is if I try to critique my own illness in the moment of it happening, it's not gonna be 100% accurate. Just like when I was actively trying to get clean from heroin, I was trying to tell everyone I was okay when I wasn't. So if the drinking was a bad decision, I'll need a few months to really fully reflect on it, but I am trying to be open and honest about it. And I do still consider myself five months sober from heroin, even though I tried drinking. I don't try to portray myself as five months sober from alcohol. I only try to say I'm five months sober from heroin, and therefore I don't feel like I need to start over at day one or anything. That's a whole nother story. Anyway, I just wanted to be very clear about all this is that my opinion on this might become a lot more firm in the future. While right now I'm still indecisive because I don't want to say that the people who can safely do these things are wrong. And then I'm personally even trying it myself and I don't know if it's right or wrong either. So anyway, I need a while to figure that part out. But everything that I do talk about in here isn't from my own opinion, it's from what I actually learned in meetings and stuff. So just know that what I decide to share as actual facts about recovery is not from my own opinion. I'm way too early in sobriety to actually know that kind of stuff as fact. Everything I do talk about is stuff I learned from actual experts in this not just my own brain. No matter where you are on the spectrum, I don't recommend trying anything unless you are in like a group that's gonna help you and support you because say you do wanna experiment. For example, I really just for some reason wanted to see how I would react to taking a drink. If I would have taken that drink and it would have set me off on this and I wasn't getting help, I wouldn't tell anyone. I would just start this whole process over again. So before I started to even, before I even tried the drink, I let my therapist know that I was gonna try to. So if it went wrong, she would be able to help me and stop me from starting this whole pattern. I think if you're gonna try to experiment that you have to be in a program somewhere that's gonna help you in case it goes wrong because it very easily can go wrong. There's some addicts and alcoholics that can't even have mouthwash without it triggering them, which is another really good example of how all of this can start without you even knowing it. You have all this hole inside of you and you're an addict or an alcoholic and you're like having mouthwash or maybe wine at dinner with your fam uh, family and friends. That's how it can 
innocently start because you're just doing things that you don't even think are going to affect you and then all of a sudden your body's telling you like you need it you need it you need it and you're like why am i obsessing over this for me it actually did start i was very spiritually sick i had a lot of issues in my life and i wasn't treating any of it and i was at a party in california i tried a little bit of vodka and it just made me think like oh my god maybe i want more and instead of drinking after that i really wasn't interested in drinking i went on to coke and then i went on to heroin because opiates were the main thing for me we all find something that feels a little better for our specific body a lot of us are just opportunistic addicts where we just literally will react to everything the same way we just need something so an addict like that would basically say whatever you have to offer me i'll take i don't care if it's meth i don't care if it's heroin i don't care if i'm smoking it or shooting it or i don't care if it's alcohol I just want something and that's a very real kind of addiction too you don't have to have a drug of choice but yeah this video is probably going on long enough already but basically that's how the cycle works hopefully i explained it well because i know my handwriting is kind of crazy on this it's a very very real thing and it's not just you know i get sad because someone doesn't treat me right and instead of wanting to deal with it i'm like i'm just gonna get high like no obviously for a while it feels okay and it feels all right but the main problem isn't us trying to avoid our feelings intentionally it's literally an actual illness that's happening but there are of course again like i said there are people that don't have this illness that do just go through something really really crappy and they want to numb it knowingly and they start and then they just keep going and then all of a sudden they feel dependent on it and that's just as valid. Of course, you should, you deserve help. You deserve to get off of it, everything like that. I don't think anyone deserves shame with this. I don't care. I just, I feel like no one knows our particular lives enough to judge, to be able to shame you and say you should have made a different choice instead. For people that say you don't deserve sympathy because you chose drugs or whatever, I just think that's silly because you are not in that person's brain to know exactly how you would respond to their entire life of events that led them up to deciding to pick up. And maybe you wouldn't in your head, but that's good, just don't do it yourself. And I just think there's, the guilt and the shame feeds the addiction. If you tell someone that they don't deserve help, if you tell an addict that, even if they're yelling at you, no, I do deserve help, they secretly think they don't. They secretly feel ashamed, they feel embarrassed, they feel disgusted. Because even though there's, you know, so much evidence out there that this is an illness, when you're dealing with it, it still is so hard to, you know, you, you want to feel like you're in control. So a part of you always says, like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you stop? And you feel disgusting about yourself. And I promise there's just no, there's no need to shame. You shame an addict, they're not going to get help. They're not gonna suddenly be like, wow, you know what? You're right, it was shitty of me to do this. So let me just put this down. No, if they realize it was shitty of them, it's just gonna make this shit bigger. And it's just gonna feed their illness. And that's not all to say that if an addict does something really crappy to you or to loved ones that they don't need to make amends. They absolutely do. Part of the 12 step program, if they do get into it, is making amends and that's closer to the end of the program and they have to learn how to, you know, right the wrongs of the people they hurt in their life because they absolutely, if people hurt you and do you wrong, you deserve to get an apology for it. If you have been hurt by an addict, if someone in your life has done you really wrong and suffered from addiction, I highly, highly suggest, I say this all the time, but going to a program called Al-Anon. Al-Anon is completely free, fully anonymous, is free to all ages. There's also a program called Alateen that's more focused for like 8 to 17 year olds, but Al-Anon is still open to all ages. It's just the other one's a little more focused to the younger crowd. But basically it's a program that helps non-addicts, so people who don't deal with addiction, learn how to help and support addicts. It also helps you heal from pain that addicts have caused you. It's not just a place where people tell you you have to sympathize with the addict, it's also just a place to get support from peers that understand what you're going through, to learn how to heal from addicts hurting you, to learn your place in all of this, learn just how much you can help and just how much you absolutely can't help. Because with all of this crap going on, if an addict doesn't want to get help, they're not gonna if they don't do this 
to a point where they decide they want to get better, they won't get better. That doesn't mean that if you get the chance to throw them into rehab, even if they don't want to go, that you shouldn't. Sometimes, like, I didn't decide I wanted to be sober until I was actually in rehab. So it's worth a shot, of course, but if it's too straining on you, if it's too emotional for you, if you are just hurting yourself more by trying to help the addict, there is a healthy time to distance yourself. So I'm getting off the topic completely and I'll go into all that again in another video. But again, if you've been hurt by an addict, I think that's a really good program to help you learn how to heal. It's free, it's anonymous, it's all over the United States. There's all different vibes because they're all run by different people. So some might be better than others for your specific needs but I highly suggest checking it out if you've been hurt by an addict or you're trying to help an addict in your life because it can be really, really, really hard. Even as an addict myself, even as someone who now understands it completely, I am still extremely traumatized from what I went through with my ex, watching him lose himself to an addiction. Even though I ended up doing it too, it was still an extremely, extremely traumatic thing that I still can barely talk about most of it. I mean, I barely touched the surface in my heroin video, so yeah. Anyway, I hope this was informative, and yeah, if you do have questions, just know this is the very beginning of a very long series, and I hope you guys enjoy it, and I hope I can teach you guys some cool things about it. And thank you for checking out my channel. Make sure to check out my other videos if you have. This is my second channel. I do have a main channel where I post like animal content, of course, so you can check that out too, and I will see you guys next time. I love you guys, and thank you for watching. I don't know what I was about to write. Cool. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Please don't tell someone that's an addict that they just need therapy and they'll be fine. Like it is a whole thing and it's a really huge process and trying to get sober is very painful and hard, especially in early recovery. There's a lot of urges that are really, really hard to deal with and it's not something easy to do. It's a really big process and that's why a lot of people relapse is they think they're dealing with their emotional trauma, but they actually have so much that they don't even know about and it sneaks back up on them. It's a really sneaky, sneaky disease where you really think you're okay or that you're better because you put down the drug, but there's actually still so much going on. And then before you know it, you have no clue why, but you're using again. So there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of people when they get sober aren't actually fully ready to get into all of their issues and that causes them to go right back out. Um, a lot of people do try their hardest, but still just don't get there. So I'm not saying it's as simple as go to therapy and you'll walk out cured. It's not it, but it's just a visual on how it does work. But I just wanted to stress that it is a very, I very, very much simplified it. And that's all I want to stress before I end this video, because I don't want people to be like, oh, if I just go see a therapist one time, I'll never have to use again. Cause no, it, it's a whole process. Not just the spirit, it's the mind, body, and spirit. So it's not just deal with the spirit stuff and you're fine. You still have the physical cravings, the mental cravings and urges that you have to deal with, but the idea behind it is, is if you deal with the spiritual stuff, the rest of the stuff gets more manageable and easier to deal with. That doesn't mean it actually is easy. It's just easier. So yeah. Um, I hope I kind of explained that well. I just spit. Um, I don't want to spit on people. Either way, hopefully this whole series can help some people that are either struggling or know someone that's struggling or just wants to learn about addiction in general. That's all I want to do. Um, I feel really lucky and fortunate with all the help I've got and I just want to give that help back out to you guys. Because another really big part in sobriety is the idea that if you give back to others it makes you more capable to stay sober by helping others. So um, yeah, that's, that's today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs>